What's going on guys, this is Rob, and per your request, we are remastering Spider-Verse. At least 70% of you guys said you wanted me to remaster Spider-Verse, more like 75%, because Spider-Man No Way Home was a giant multiversal story, so I guess it makes sense. And so in order to make things easier for you guys, I'm gonna put the reading order down in the description so you guys can basically keep up as you guys buy the comics and, and read them and so on and so forth. Uh, but this picks up with Superior Spider-Man. Now, for those of you guys who don't know what that is, Superior Spider-Man was the story arc where Dr. Octopus took over the body of Peter Parker. And so he basically became the new Spider-Man. It was an amazing story. The entirety of the Spider-Verse event actually happens between two issues with Superior Spider-Man. So you don't really see the event play out per se in the Superior Spider-Man comic as it was initially written. Instead, what you get are Superior Spider-Man tie-in stories to the events of Spider-Verse. And so the way this would happen is that there was basically this giant explosion that took place uh, that was a result of a temporal meltdown at Horizon Labs. Now, those of you guys, you may be familiar with it. If you guys saw the Morbius trailer, you saw Horizon, one of the buildings in the background. It was literally the only building with red lighting on it, right? Red wording. So of course, we seem to know that Mobius takes place in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or at least that seems to be the case. Horizon Labs is really a think tank when it comes to the Marvel Comics universe, right? Just where a bunch of smart people hang out and just think of cool stuff. And so with that explosion taking place, Superior Spider-Man was thrown into the time stream. Now this happening was actually pretty cool because if you look at this scene where he's thrown into the time stream, in the very top left, hand corner, that's the Earth X Captain America. That's actually the universe that the Eternals film is based off of. Next to him is what looks like the Incredible Hulk, because it is. He's actually called Maestro, and it's basically a future version of the Incredible Hulk, where the world had succumbed to, like, nuclear war, and he basically led this city called Dystopia. Over on Geek Culture Explained, I still stand by the fact, and I've been making the argument over there, that what Bruce Banner saw in Avengers Age of Ultron was actually himself becoming the Maestro, but you just see these kind of alternate realities, right? Old Man Logan, different things along those lines, but he's just kind of thrown into the time stream until ultimately he arrives in the 2099 universe. Now, the 2099 universe of Marvel Comics is actually a really, really cool universe. It was created by Peter David and it's been around since the 90s. In fact, it was one of the more popular lines of comics Marvel had in the 90s. Like most of those alternate realities, like the Ultimate Universe, stuff like that, it started with Spider-Man and then over time just became less interesting. <laughs> You got stuff like the 2099 Incredible Hulk and like 2099 Punisher and Doctor Doom and different things along those lines, but it's basically the, the future, right? Now, instead of having like New York, what you have is Nueva York, just kind of like this future, super technologically advanced place. But by and large, the whole area is ran by Alchemax. And this is important because once Superior Spider-Man gets into this place, because he's somewhat familiar with 2099, then of course he's able to make his way through there to a degree. And he's basically set upon by what's referred to as the public eye. Now the public eye in the 2099 universe, they're basically private police that are actually hired and work for Alchemax, the company that seemingly runs everything, or at least basically all of New York. But when this happens, of course, he's able to get past these guys quite readily. And then he's met by Gabriel O'Hara. Now, Gabriel O'Hara is the brother of Miguel O'Hara, also known as Spider-Man 2099. At the moment, he's not here, he's missing, he's actually out doing his own thing, and we'll follow up with him relatively soon. But the idea of Dr. Octopus, a really superior Spider-Man, and being in this place, of course, he's greeted by Gabriel and then he's like, I don't need you anymore, right? Like, all I want to do is find my way back home, back to my native universe, and we're going to call it a day. Now, here's the funny thing about this. When it comes to Dr. Octopus, historically in the movies, his intelligence has been downplayed. Despite how smart you've seen him come off in the movies, he is not nearly as intelligent in the movies as he is in the comics. In the comics, he's light years ahead of everybody. He's like Tony Stark, right? He's a futurist. He's always thinking to the future, always looking to the horizon. And so he's basically given this kind of sentient AI computer system, which is partially self-aware, but still has to follow the programming that's assigned to it, and asks it the best way to achieve interdimensional travel or time travel. Now, as you would expect, time travel is highly regulated in any one particular universe. And a lot of this falls in line with the nature of organizations like the Time Variance Authority itself, as well as the organizational structures of that particular universe. And what I mean by that is the TVA, as most of you guys probably know from the Loki series, albeit that series was a little bit different from the comics, that it is by and large governed by the timekeepers. And the goal of the timekeepers is to basically ensure their existence, right? That they come into existence at the end of time and they wanna make sure that like nothing happens across the multiverse that prevents them from existing. And so they closely monitor individuals who travel back and forth through time, making sure they don't disrupt the time stream too much. So there's that kind of regulation that goes into it. At the same time, if you're a massive company like Alchemax and you have all this power, you don't want anybody going back in time and preventing your company from existing. 
existing. And so that's the kind of regulation you end up seeing. People who aren't meddling with time and like disrupting existing status quos or possibly even sending the universe on a collision course to a far worse future than the one that currently exists. So there's all kinds of things you can screw up with time. And that's why it's monitored so closely. Fortunately for us, Superior Spider-Man doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter to him. And in fact, he actually ends up breaking into all these different facilities and stealing all these different things he needs in order to attain the ability to travel through time or to move from one dimension or one universe to the next. Now, with Dr. Octopus, he can get away with that, right? It's like giving Tony Stark the ability to achieve time travel. Just part and parcel of his intelligence is knowing there's some things you just can't do, right? You can't disrupt time too much. You've got to be very, very careful. Another part of this is that as he's been working with this AI, and this is a particular important point going forward, he actually tells it to start modifying its physical appearance so it looks like Anna Maria Marconi. Now, the reason why that matters is Anna Maria Marconi was a diminutive woman who was also incredibly intelligent and actually challenged Otto Octavius in a lot of different ways. She believed he was Peter Parker. She didn't really know the truth. She found out later on, but she was one of the few people out there that kept pushing him to be better. And so because of the fact that she was not content with mediocrity, she would call him out when he was wrong. She would say like, you're better than what you currently are right now. It wasn't just... I like you as you are, and that's fine, right? She wanted to see him become better to live up to his full potential that he actually developed a huge amount of respect for her and then started falling in love with her. And so he basically misses her. And that all ties into the nature of Superior Spider-Man, right? Dr. Octopus basically reforming, becoming a hero instead of a villain, forming Parker Industries, which actually became like this worldwide multi-billion dollar philanthropy-based organization. He created all these little pieces of technology that made Peter Parker's life better as Spider-Man. It was really, really cool in terms of how all that that stuff work. But once the actual system is set up and he's ready to travel, one of the things that he had done is created a snapback protocol so that if he ends up jumping into an alternate universe and like it's in the middle of a meteor crashing into it and everyone's dying, he can snap back. <laughs> because wouldn't it suck if he traveled to a new universe and a meteor was about to crash into it, he had like 10 seconds to live and that was that, right? Like it would, it would really blow balls. And so once he ends up passing through, because of the nature of traveling through the multiverse is not as simple as simply just jumping back to a period in time, trying to travel through space and time, the fact that the multiverse actually moves the way the Earth orbits around the sun, that is a very, very precise system. And so he ultimately ends up missing where it is that he's supposed to be. Instead, he shows up in an alternate reality where Spider-Man had joined the Fantastic Four, and this version of Spider-Man's been killed. Not only that, he snaps back and ends up in an alternate reality, the House of M universe. Most of you guys have heard of that, the universe where the Scarlet Witch had basically rewrote reality to give everybody everything Thing they subconsciously desired, Spider-Man in that universe is killed. Then he snaps back and ends up in a Civil War universe where basically the Civil War never ended. And that version of Spider-Man is killed. That every single universe he goes to, the Spider-Men in these different universes have all been killed. They've been executed. But the more crazy thing about this is they've all been killed in the exact same way. The two same puncture marks, right? So seemingly someone or something is traveling around the multiverse and killing all these different versions of Spider-Man. And so what it does is it switches over to what's probably one of the cooler versions of Spider-Man. Once Superior Spider-Man jumps back to 2099 and then jumps into the time stream again, you actually end up in an alternate reality where you get Spider-Man India, which is cool. And then you find the guy who's basically killing everybody. Now, this thing here, this guy, he's what's called an inheritor. And we'll learn more about the inheritors as time goes on. The important thing, and really what Dan Slott gives us here is that this guy, Spider-Man India, seemingly has all the same powers that you would expect from a Spider-Man, right? Like the powers of Peter Parker. So like the proportional strength of a spider, the ability to climb on walls, shoot webbing, different things like that. A lot of that stuff just kind of universal from one universe to the next. But this guy, this Spider-Man India is getting totally wrecked by, by this inheritor, right? I mean, literally he's just fleeing for his life. Nothing's working. Absolutely nothing is working here. And so what you end up getting is this, this kind of cat and mouse game, this incredible maneuver that's made by this inheritor where he actually ends up forcing a building to crumble, which draws the attention of Spider-Man because as you guys know, Spider-Man would never let innocent people die. And then in turn, because he's distracted, it's basically game over. There's no way for this guy to win. And then enter Superior Spider-Man who saves this dude's life, right? Just saves this guy's life by an instant. I mean, this dude was like moments away from 
being killed. And so once this guy is basically defeated, of course, he's, you know, we really have superhero Spider-Man telling us this guy's being held at bay. He starts talking to Spider-Man India. And what he says is that as he's been traveling through the multiverse, presumably trying to find his way home, his mission to get back to the main Marvel universe shifted because every universe he came across, Spider-Man were being killed. And Dr. Octopus being as intelligent as he is deduced someone or something is hunting Spider-Man from across the multiverse. And so it's only a matter of time before they come for him. And so what he actually has been doing is assembling a team of different Spider-Man from across the multiverse, all of whom intend to face off against this guy, this person, this basically taking them all out. And so once Spider-Man India is brought back to the Marvel 2099 universe, you end up seeing like five other Spider-Man, including Spider-Man Noir. But one of them is also Assassin Spider-Man, who's one of the coolest versions of the character. Okay, so here's, here's the origin of Assassin Spider-Man, right? We're gonna switch over to this. It's actually kind of a backup feature in Superior Spider-Man number 32. That what you end up finding out here is that somewhere along the line, the Green Goblin had actually murdered Gwen Stacy. And unlike the main Marvel Universe, where the death of Gwen Stacy taught Peter Parker that he couldn't be reckless, in this alternate reality, the death of Gwen Stacy taught Spider-Man to take no prisoners. And so every single villain that he had that he came across, he killed. He just executed them, right? Like Craven the Hunter, he just killed them, as he should have been doing. And of course, one of the things that also goes on here is that because there are some threats out there that Spider-Man's going to have to contend with and his skills aren't quite up to snuff, he actually ends up training with Wolverine. Now, this may seem kind of like weird to have him train with Wolverine, but it actually makes perfect sense. And the reason why is because Wolverine's trained a lot of people in Marvel Comics. Black Widow learned how to fight from Wolverine when she was in the Red Room. You had all kinds of people who have, who have trained with this guy, right? And it's one of these things in Marvel Comics, it's a hodgepodge. Somewhere along the line, seemingly everybody's trained with everybody else. The only real exception to that insofar as the one person that like everybody's trained with is actually two people. And they're really more teachers than anything else. The first one is Taskmaster, right? Like Tony Masters. That guy, I mean, he's he's the guy you want to train with. He usually trains villains, but heroes are trained with him as well. But the other person and probably the more significant trainer of heroes in Marvel Comics is Shang-Chi. He's trained really almost everyone in some form or fashion. Even if there's someone like Wolverine that already had a formidable set of skills, all Shang-Chi did was hone them and make them better. So again, it's one of these things where Tony Masters and Shang-Chi are kind of like the one-two punch of people that you train with, but this guy, this version of Spider-Man training with Wolverine made him far more ruthless and far more brutal because it's just the nature of Wolverine's training. And so of course, when this inheritor showed up in that universe and immediately started going after that version of Spider-Man, the assassin Spider-Man, that Wolverine stepped in the way and Wolverine was totally incinerated, right? Of course, all that's really left is his adamantium skeleton. Now, this is one of those things where Marvel plays it fast and loose. If you read Days of Future Past, Marvel's like, yeah, man, Wolverine's entire skeleton was incinerated and he died. But then you go and you read a story like Civil War where where Nitro blows up in front of Wolverine and reduces him down to his skeleton and he regrows, right? So it's one of those things where it just kind of goes either way. Wolverine's ability to heal from an injury is more of a plot device than anything else, especially when it's an injury this extreme. But what it does is it allows uh, Assassin Spider-Man to basically temporarily gain the upper hand on this inheritor, even if only for a moment. Now, during this process, he's actually met by Alex. Now we're not given a whole lot of information about Alex. All we really know is that she's basically the girl that this version of Spider-Man ended up up with that like the main Marvel universe that following the death of Gwen Stacy, Peter Parker, at least in this reality, ended up with Mary Jane Watson. But then along the way, he met Alex. He broke up with Mary Jane Watson and got with Alex instead. Most likely it seems to be because the mentality Alex had is more in line with the mentality of Assassin Spider-Man. But at the end of the day, you actually get this really, really cool moment where Assassin Spider-Man's fighting the Inheritor and he realizes his staff basically relies on energy. And so his response is, then we'll just overload it, right? So he actually leads him to this location which is just a giant power battery, more or less. And as the two of them are fighting, the staff is temporarily overloaded. But at the end of the day, the inheritor pulls it back out and the fight's on again. And it's one of these things where he's just kind of like, I'm entertained, right? Like your death will be quicker than most because you know, you kind of gave me a good fight, right? I respect you. So I'm not going to kill you slowly. And so ultimately this guy kind of just seems to be unstoppable. There's no real way for anyone to overcome him. But then what actually ends up happening is that while this fight's taking place, Superior Spider-Man shows up. He ends up ripping a tree out of the ground and throws 
throwing it at this dude and sending him flying. And so that's the explanation of how it is that as these two meet up, Superior Spider-Man had assassinated Spider-Man in his ranks because he saved yet another Spider-Man from being killed by one of the inheritors. Now, at this point, we switch over to what's called the Edge of Spider-Verse. So the way the Spider-Verse was told, it was told in a couple different forms. The first is that you followed Superior Spider-Man, then you go into Edge of Spider-Verse, which is basically these stories that give you like either origins on different versions of Spider-Man or stories involving existing Spider-Man from across the multiverse in terms of how it all ties together and how they ended up as part of the Spider-Verse event. And so in this instance, we actually end up picking up with Spider-Man Noir, who's actually been around since 2009. So he was, he appeared about five years before this story was written. And one of the things to know, the way Peter Parker gained his powers in this particular story, because the Marvel Noir series was designed to be a lot more grounded than what you saw in terms of just the traditional Marvel Comics line. So like radioactive spiders biting people and instead of them succumbing to radiation poisoning, they get powers. The way you actually saw here was basically a kind of spider idol, which really seemed to be imbued with magical energy. So, I mean, I guess, you know, kind of grounded. <laughs> I don't know. But regardless, Peter Parker in this universe was bitten by one of those spiders and then he woke up with the with Spider-Man powers as you would expect. What you also have here is somebody called uh, the Magical Mysterio or like the Amazing Mysterio. What's really going on here and, and kind of an important thing to understand, these aren't really significant moments. We're really covering this because of the way that it ends. But basically Mysterio is a guy, the Magnificent Mysterio, he's a guy vying for power, right? Wilson Fisk, Kingpin is running New York. He's the guy that wants to take his place as like the new crime boss is really all it is. And that's one of the things that kind of happens is you have this bit of a discussion where like Wilson Fisk walks in on Mysterio talking about how he's going to basically steal the powers of Spider-Man and then in turn, he's going to be the one to run New York, right? So when you're Wilson Fisk, that stuff doesn't really bother you because you know that people are just gonna come gunning for you at some point along the line. And so one of the things that goes on here is you actually have Wilson Fisk trying to gain information on the identity of Spider-Man. And that's been an ongoing theme in the Spider-Man Noir series for quite some time. They actually end up visiting Felicia Hardy. Now, Felicia Hardy was at one point in a relationship with a villain called the Crime Master, but was in love with Spider-Man Noir. And when the Crime Master learned this, he ended up slashing her face. And that's why she wears a white mask because her face is scarred all the hell. And so because of that, it's basically like her saying like, I don't know the identity of Spider-Man. I'm in love with him, but I don't know him personally. But while all this is happening, right? All these little plot threads and things like that are going on. Peter Parker in this universe is experiencing this kind of dull headache that just kind of seems to be sitting back there. There really doesn't seem to be any indication in terms of the fact that there's like an immediate threat. That's kind of how his spider sense manifests. It's sort of a dull pain, but it just kind of kicks in whenever any like massive event takes place. So very, very similar to the spider sense of Peter Parker from the main Marvel universe. But what his sense is basically telling him is there's a threat out there somewhere. And it's a kind of a kind of a bit of an annoyance here because if it's like, if there's a threat out there somewhere, like why doesn't the threat manifest itself, right? I mean, keep in mind, Peter Parker's spider sense doesn't tell him where the threat is coming from. It just says there is a threat there, kind of like a, a sixth sense. And he even refers to it as like an ESP to a degree. But during this whole thing, because of the fact that Mysterio is trying to get his hands on, uh, on the blood of Spider-Man, Man Noir for the purpose of finding a way to basically make himself someone that has powers akin to Spider-Man, that he actually ends up challenging Spider-Man Noir publicly in the newspapers by saying like, there is going to be a girl you're gonna have to rescue, right? Can you live up to the challenge? That kind of a thing. Now, behind the scenes, the indication is he's actually going to kill her. Like Mysterio really will kill this girl if uh, Spider-Man Noir doesn't show up. And because he's a quote unquote magician, the audience will believe it's a trick when it's actually real, right? And Spider-Man Noir will kind of have to live with that. So of course he ends up showing up here. And when that happens, he's overcome pretty quickly by a kind of uh, gaseous substance, which basically knocks him out temporarily. And then of course he's hoisted up. And in response to that, the entire, you know, casket basically that he's in is filled with water. Keep in mind, this is all real. It's designed to look like a trick to the audience because they're like, I mean, this is crazy. Mysterio couldn't kill Spider-Man in front of everybody, right? It's not like he can march him out on stage, put a gun to the back of his head and shoot him, right? Because then they would all be like, my God, you killed a man. But like, if you make it look like a trick, then it's like, wow, that was so impressive. We watched a man die, but we're too foolish to know what actually happened, right? That kind of a thing. Now, at this point, you get this kind of plot device where basically Spider-Man Noir shoots webbing on his face, which like traps a bit of oxygen. And then he's like, the oxygen saved me from drowning, right? And then it's that kind of a thing. Now, honestly, it would kill him because he's, he's exhaling CO2, right? So basically he's breathing in a poisonous substance. The oxygen would run out, but it's comic book logic. 
roll with it. <laughs> Don't ask too many questions, guys. If you try to take comic books too seriously, you're going to make yourself go crazy. And so, of course, he ends up basically making his escape. He fights Mysterio, you know, kind of beats him up a little bit. And the day's more or less saved. And he frees Felicia Hardy and all that kind of stuff. And that's it. And then the Inheritor pops up. And that's kind of how this happens, right? These guys teleport into universes, right? Teleport into these spaces. And so when this guy arrives, Superior Spider-Man shows up. It's one of these things where literally Superior Spider-Man teleports in, grabs Spider-Man War, and teleports out. And that's it. Because by this point in time, as this kind of conversation begins to progress and we start to get into the next part of our little story here that what you have is basically the realization by Superior Spider-Man they can't beat this guy as a small number. Hence the reason why the entire team was formed. And so what you get is a, is a different reality where you basically have Cyborg Spider-Man. He's pretty cool, but he looks pretty amazing. This inheritor shows up and then you actually end up finding out that at some point along the line, Superior Spider-Man visited Cyborg Spider-Man and informed him of what was going on. That seemingly the inheritor would come after him somewhere along the line and that ultimately when that happens he actually ends up calling in all these different spider-man right so like spider-man india spider-man noir the superior spider-man spider-girl right so like ashley barton from the old man logan universe she was amazing oh my god i loved her character so much in old man logan dude you guys remember that she was all like helpless and she needed to be saved and then like once she was saved she was like i'm ruling everything now she like turned out to be a villain it was awesome by the way if you guys want to see like the origins or explanations on any of the characters that we cover here that you're not like familiar with, let me know. And like, I'll make, you know, we'll, we'll kind of like pause the series for a second and make videos about some of these characters because I feel like some of you guys are gonna wanna know like the origins of these guys and things along those lines. But ultimately they all end up teaming up against uh, against this inheritor and they actually draw this really cool conclusion. Superior Spider-Man realized that while this guy is going around killing Spider-Man, that what he's doing is absorbing their energy. And so finding a way to reverse engineer that process, he could actually use that energy against him, right? They could basically siphon that energy off of him and basically make him weak. The nature of Ashley Barton, right? Like the daughter of Hawkeye, the nature of her is she's kind of like, okay, we got to kill this guy, right? Like we got to take this guy out. And it's one of the things where the other Spider-Man are like, really? Like you want to kill? Like, I mean, are you sure about that? And then like Assassin Spider-Man's like, yeah, man, he's been killing us, right? Like we just got to eliminate this guy. Be done with it. Call it a day. Why would we let this guy live? He's going to find some way to escape. What do you think is going to happen? He's going to be in prison and then realize his heart was three sizes too small small and he's going to become a good guy and help us is that really what you think is going to happen no he's a villain kill him <laughs> <laughs> and so there's this kind of big debate that goes on there. But Superior Spider-Man steps in and says, before we kill this guy at all, we need information, right? And so he asks him, like, what's your mission? And the response to the Inheritor is like, there is no mission, right? This is what my kind does. We kill spiders. It's our way. As for others like me, pray you never meet the rest of my family. And that's when it takes Superior Spider-Man by surprise. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's more than one of you? And his response is like, oh yeah, there's, there's more than one of us. And so the question Superior Spider-Man asks here is, will my weapon function as well against these others, I warn you, I will know if you lie. And the response to this guy is, I mean, sure, like it'll function as well against the others as it does against me, which is completely and totally ineffective. And then just like breaks out, right? And it's just like, I was just wanting to hear what you guys were saying. I just wanted to hear what your plan was, understand what you guys were doing. And this massive fight breaks out. Now, all these Spider-Man are facing one inheritor. They're doing what they can. But at the end of the day, even for just one inheritor, they're all being painfully overpowered, right? I mean, like, they're attacking as best they can, but they can't kill this guy, right? Like all they can do is kind of throw him around, pummel him a little bit. They set him on fire and it doesn't work. And then it's just like, okay, this could not possibly get any worse. And they're suddenly met by the arrival of two other inheritors. Now, of course you learn this guy we've been following the whole time, his name is Karn, but basically he's kind of seen as like a shameful member of the family, not as powerful, it's just kind of uh, kind of shame that he carries. And we'll talk more about that later. But like these other two showing up, if there was ever a fight to be had here, it's long since gone. They overpower these guys with a quickness, right? These inheritors, they overpower these Spider-Men so fast. And like Superior spider mans like, we have to go. We can't stay here. If we stay here, we're all gonna die. I'm sounding a retreat. And some of them don't want to, but it's like, no. Like, like you guys remember that scene from Aliens when when uh, when Hicks was like, Marines, we are leaving. It's that, right? I mean, it's, it's just, it's a massacre. It's them just like trying to live. 
And so ultimately, they actually, the inheritors end up fighting amongst themselves. And that's just what Superior Spider-Man and those guys need, is to, to basically have a distraction to make their escape. They open their portals and they bail. They immediately take off. And so following that, you have this kind of discussion that goes on where one, Superior Spider-Man ends up creating an arm for one of the Spider-Man to basically upgrade his uh, cybernetic devices so he can, you know, hack into the systems from Alchemax without being detected. And he's like, your job is to hunt for the names of the inheritors throughout the entire history that Alchemax has at their disposal. If they're moving through universes, it also means they're moving through time. So they could appear at any point in time across the entirety of the multiverse. If they're hunting Spider-Man, there's a good chance they've appeared in the past, find their names. And that assignment actually ends up going out to the six-armed Spider-Man as well, right? To kind of hunt throughout the entirety of the time stream, space and time itself, and find some reference for these guys anywhere. The next thing is it actually ends up going to Spider-Man India and, well, he really calls him Turtleneck, but it's basically Spider-Man Noir, where he's like, you're going to find out where their home universe is. If they are hunting Spider-Man throughout the multiverse, then it means they're retreating somewhere. They're going somewhere. They live somewhere. Find their home. Whether it's an entire universe or some pocket dimension somewhere, find out where they live. And so what he actually ends up doing is pulling aside Ashley Barton and pulling aside Assassin Spider-Man. And this is one of the cool things because these were the two who immediately said, we have to kill this inheritor guy. And so one of the things Superior Spider-Man picked up on is that the other Spider-Man who were here are all very closely modeled after Peter Parker, right? They're just alternate reality versions of Peter in the sense that they almost exactly mirror his mannerisms, but also his moral compass. They're not willing to kill. And so it's one of the things that kind of goes on because he says, I wanted to speak to the two of you privately. I feel we share a certain perspective that eludes our allies. And that's when Assassin Spider-Man is like, don't dance around it. We're killers. And Superior Spider-Man says, yes. He's like, I wasn't really dancing around it. It's more than that. The others may have killed in dire circumstances. I don't really know. But it's clear to me that we three have seen things that they have not. Brutality, devastation, darkness. The others think they've seen the worst that life has to offer because they've lost a loved one or two. But we have seen the face of true evil and we understand what is required to stop it. This is incredibly important because he goes on to say, these beings we fight belong to the same family. To end their threat, we may have to commit a genocide. And by way of that, we may find our allies standing in our way i.e. if it comes down to it, I need to know you're willing to kill other Spider-Man in order to ensure we can end this threat. It's pretty extreme, right? It's just that severe of a conflict in the eyes of superior Spider-Man. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section. For those of you guys who never saw or never read uh, Spider-Verse, it's a really, really cool story. And it only gets better when you end up with like cosmic Spider-Man, right? So like Spider-Man with the Enigma Force, that guy was nuts. But let me know what you guys think down in the comment section. We're we're going to bring this video to an end and I will catch you all later. Peace.